welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. As I said a moment ago, we know and understand that the book of 1 Peter was written to believers who were in a province of Rome. And it was at that time where Nero decided to burn Rome. And you can imagine the environment that was present then where the Roman citizens themselves, not just the Christians, but the Roman citizens, they lost everything. Their homes, their jobs, their livelihoods, their businesses, uh, the many great cultural artifacts of Rome were all burnt up and and just uh, were gone in a moment. Nero's solution to take the heat off of himself was to blame Christians. That's a historical fact. And so it wasn't just the Roman government who were after Christians, it was the people who had been convinced by Nero that they were to blame. And so everyone hated Christians in Rome. And it's the context here is that kind of suffering from Rome and Roman citizens that the believers were facing. And Peter writes to them because he wants them to stay strong in the Lord. He wants them to remain faithful to the calling of God on their lives, all the while being filled with joy and peace and happiness because they have contentment in God. He wants them to praise God even in the midst of their distress. And so that's the focus of this passage, praising the God of salvation, praising God for his great work of salvation. Our first point is interesting. Our first point is in verse 3, and if you look there, uh, we could say it this way, that all praise is due to God. And look at verse 3, for he has caused us to be born again. These believers here in Rome, will they need their head turned and their attention turned to God and what he has done specifically? And Peter reminds them that their God has caused them to be born again. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word there, blessed, uh, it means to praise someone because of their inherent worth. The NIV translates the word as praised. It's where we get our word eulogy. It means to, to speak well of. Here Peter is saying that God is to be praised because of his great work of salvation that he has brought about in Christ Jesus. And he tells us this by saying that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us something very, very important. That God and God alone is the one who has caused us to be born again. Got that? God is the one who has caused us to be born again. And we could say it this way, that just as you and I played no part in our biological birth, so too you and I play no part in our spiritual birth. It is God who initiates that. It is God who causes us to be born again. Let's look at this for a moment. You may remember that uh, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus was the teacher in Israel. He was the one who was meant to be the most learned of all the scribes and teachers. And Jesus said to him that unless you were born again, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus scratched his head and had no idea what Jesus was talking about. Jesus actually said, literally, you must be born from above. That's what the Greek says. You must be born from above. And the implication is that the physical birth, the physical birth is not sufficient. There's a problem. You must be born again. You must be recreated. Shouldn't Nicodemus have known better? Well, I think he should have because the Old Testament, which he would have known so well, spoke of a coming day when God would do a great work of transformation, not on an external level, but on an internal level, where he would change their hearts and change their natures. Listen to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, 26. And you can just write these titles down if you want, like and look at them later if you can't keep up. But Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, and this is a new covenant promise. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. There's nothing about physical transformation, is there? That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the inner man, your soul, your heart, your inner man being renewed like never before. This is what it means to be born again. We have the phrase 1 Peter 1 3 and 1 23, where born again is being spoken of, and it simply means to beget, to reproduce, to bring something forth. And it's almost always used in the context of a child being born from its mother. And we might ask the question well, how does the new birth occur? How does it occur and why? Uh, why is it necessary? And that's a really good set of questions to ask. Why is the new birth necessary? Um, Obviously, Jesus put a prerequisite of going to heaven upon a person being born again. It's so vital, it's so necessary that you will not be able to go to heaven unless you are born again. But why is it so necessary? Well, let's just think about it this way. The Bible tells us that the person who is born into this world through the natural birth of his mother, because of Adam's sin... This person, and it's all of us, is born into the world with a sin nature. We also know that when Adam sinned in the garden, he was charged with sin and became a sinner. And all of humanity, the whole human race, was declared guilty along with him because he was our representative. He was our federal head, we might say. We also know that through procreation, sin is passed on from generation to generation. And to make matters worse... Sin is not something that is innocuous, is it? It completely debilitates and destroys a person. So much so that the Bible tells us in Romans 5.10 that we become God's enemies. The moment we are born into this world, we are positionally God's enemies. Ephesians 2.3, children of wrath. Romans 8.7 tells us that the natural man, the person born into this world who has not yet been redeemed, he has not got the ability or the capacity to submit to God's law. That's Romans 8, 7 to 8. Ephesians 2, 1, spiritually dead. Not alive spiritually, but spiritually dead. Romans 6, slaves of sin. Moreover, man, when he's born into this world, is born with a sin debt. A sin debt. He owes something to God. He's violated God's law. And as we grow and get older and older and older, that sin debt simply increases. But you might ask, well, that's a pretty bleak picture. And often it's the time where we share such things with those in the world and they don't agree or they don't see it because they look around and they see that man generally is quite good, quite nice. People do good deeds. They set up charities and aid agencies and so on. Is man that good? Well, I would answer that by saying first and foremost that we can't see the thoughts and intentions of the heart, right? And we all might look good externally, but there's a whole lot of wickedness on the inside. But we would also say that God, by his common grace, restrains the sin in unbelievers. That's what he does. How does he do it? Well, through law, through government, through police, through military, through policies, and so on. It's also through his word and the church as we combat and balance out the evils of this world by proclaiming truth and calling for justice and equity and so on. But all that to say, the natural man who's born into this world, he has no capacity to love God, no capacity to obey God. He cannot submit to God's law even if he wanted to. His nature, his natural nature, prevents him from doing what God requires him to do. So he's in trouble. He's in trouble. He cannot do what he needs to do. He's spiritually dead. Now, we've got to realise that this natural man born into the world, which is what we all were once, the natural man needs something more than forgiveness, right? Because you might think, well, all the person needs is to have all of their sins erased. There is so much more to this than that. We need to realise and see that every single person born into this world, yes, needs their sins forgiven, but every single person needs a what? A new nature. We need to be born again so that we can love God from the depth of our inner being. 
That's what it means to be born again. The new birth is so necessary. It is so vital that no one will ever respond to God or love God or follow God without it. Well, maybe we could ask another question. What actually occurs at the new birth? What happens? How does all of this work? Maybe we could say it this way, that just as a baby being born into the world uh, cries when they're first born, so too the spiritual birth causes the person to cry out in praise to God. Every time a person is born again, there's an instant response of praise to God for what he has done. The new birth, well, that occurs at the moment of salvation. That occurs at the moment the dead soul is quickened by the grace of God uh, and, and, and enables that person to respond to God by faith and in faith, saying, I believe in God. You see, God initiates and man responds. And the two occur within a microsecond of one another, so much so that it seems to be one and the same event. But God is the one who first reaches out to that soul that is dead and lost and enslaved and gives life. And the response is instantaneous. John Piper explained this really well. Uh, well, I thought it was really good. Uh, you may not, but he spoke of a person. He said, just imagine you're lying in bed and I come up and you're asleep and I shout, wake up! And you respond within a microsecond and you sit up and wake up. He says, that's what it's like with the new birth. God comes to us and he shouts, wake up! And we respond instantly. That is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit within the life of the dead believer. And there's an instantaneous response. You see, God is the one who initiates salvation and brings it to fruition. Titus 3, 5 to 6 says that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Friends, shouldn't that cause us to praise God? The fact that God has chosen you, selected you, and seen fit by his good pleasure to wake you up, to bring you back to life, as though you were like Lazarus dead in the tomb, and he called you forth and you came forth, and now you were alive and you live for him. It wasn't your own wisdom. It wasn't your own choice and ability to say, well, today I'm just going to start following God. That was God initiating it all and working in your soul and my soul. Friends, that should cause us to praise God. This is his great and wonderful work. Again, just to recap, there are two wonderful things that really happen at the new birth. And obviously there's that element that we've just looked at where we are born again. We are given a new nature and the spirit of God dwells within us permanently so that we have new affections and new de desires and the things of the Spirit of God, they're no longer foolishness to, the, to us, but they're wisdom. They're wonderful. They're our delight. They're our joy. The law now no longer condemns us and weighs heavily upon us, but now it's a joy for us to keep and to love and to bring into our lives. But the second is this. There is also a judicial uh, sentencing that occurs. And this is wonderful because right at the new birth, when we are born again, God declares us innocent, not guilty of sin. And every sin that we have ever committed before that point and every sin that we will ever commit going forward to the time of our death was all paid for right there the moment we believe. Christ paid for it on the cross and we are forgiven the moment we come to Christ for salvation. We don't just stay there. The Bible also tells us that the judicial sentencing that we receive isn't simply the forgiveness of sins, but the law of God requires that we perfectly keep the law. And again, we can't and we haven't and we won't be able to even today. Try it. You'll see that I'm right. <laughs> but there was someone who did and there was someone who could, and there was only one person who could ever be perfectly righteous and perfectly keep every law, and that was Jesus Christ. And the wonderful truth about the new birth and salvation and the judicial sentencing is that, yes, our sins are forgiven, but God in Christ declares us righteous as he gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's almost as though Jesus Christ 
takes off his righteous robe and gives it to us as we give to him on the cross our filthy robe of sin. So when we stand before God in judgment, he sees those who are completely innocent of sin, but also perfectly righteous, having obeyed every commandment. That is our status and our standing before God. And that should cause us to praise the Lord our God from the depth of our being. Because we're alive. We were dead, now we're alive. We have new affections, new desires. The Lord our God is our heavenly Father. We have a new nature and we submit to him. We love him. We now hate sin and love truth. That which we used to love in the old life, we now hate. And that which we used to hate, we now love. God has changed us all together. And this is a wonderful blessing. Friends, that's a brief summary of what it means to be born again and what happens at the new birth. So all praise is due to God for that because he has caused us to be born again. But all praise is due to God. And the second point is this, for he has given us a living hope. He has given us a living hope. Look at verse 3 again, the second part of it. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, to a living hope. And we could say it this way, that without the new birth, our present life and our future, well, we were doomed, doomed to destruction. And through the new birth, we are given hope. And hope is unique, isn't it? Hope is, hope is something special to stop and consider because hope always looks forward. It looks forward with joy and it looks forward in anticipation to what God has promised and to what God is going to do. And hope is always based upon the promises and realities of God's word. And some people hear the phrase or the word, he has hope or hope in general, and think that it's that thing you have when you actually don't have any facts or any truth. And you kind of just hope that something happens. There's nothing to substantiate it or to ground yourself in. But that's not biblical hope. Hope is based in the promises and truths of God's word and in God's person. And that's what we have as believers. It says here that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I think that there's two elements to this. Uh, there's a, a present hope that we have, and that is as believers. Um, scripture tells us that we have been made alive. And the newness of life that we all experience, walking with God, delighting in God, being liberated from the oppressive nature of sin, that should cause us to be filled with hope even now, right? So there's a present hope. There's another reason why we ought to hope in the present and, and that comes out of Ephesians 2, 4, 6, which we sort of looked at before. And we are told that we are citizens of heaven, that this world is not our home. We sung of that before. Listen, listen to Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that verse there, verse 6, the tenses of the verbs there, well, they tell us that they all occur at the moment of salvation. You are positionally made a citizen of heaven. This world is no longer your home. We go from being dead to alive, citizens of this world to citizens of heaven. And they are present realities that we should find hope in right now. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Isn't that how the song goes? So that is the present hope that we experience. What is the future? Well, the future's, in a sense, it's pretty obvious. We'll look at this in verse 4 in a moment. Uh, but the, the future hope is that relationship that we will permanently live in and dwell in with the Lord our God. But we'll look at that in a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 16 to 18. I love the fact that Paul here, writing to the Corinthian believers, gives them hope in the present by turning their eyes and their attention to the future and what awaits them. He says in verse 16, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, 
Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He's helping them to stand strong in the midst of suffering, in the midst of opposition, and even in the physical decaying of this body. He says, look up and look forward. Remember who you have in Christ. John eleven twenty five. 25. I love this verse. Jesus said, and I believe it was to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So he is our hope. The very fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, resurrected, is the crowning proof that we too will walk in newness of life now and in the future. And I couldn't help but think of the context in which this book was written to these believers who were suffering. You think of it this way. When your livelihood, your, uh, your, your, your existence is taken away, uh, the government comes in and seizes your property, you're persecuted, you endure, you suffer, you lose much. The only way to survive that, the only way to praise God is to cast your mind upward and forward, isn't it? And that is exactly what they had to do. So our living hope in Christ illuminates our souls, even in life's darkest moments. So all praise is due to God for he's caused us to be born again. He has given us a living hope. And the third point is this. All praise is due to God for he gifts us with a fortified heavenly inheritance. He gifts us with a fortified heavenly inheritance. And now we speak about verse 4 and exactly what it is that we look forward to in the future. If you come back to verse 3, I just want to read from verse 3 to to again set the context a little. Uh, He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now there's a prepositional phrase here. The first one is this, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We've looked at that. The second prepositional phrase, he's caused us to be born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is all about the new birth. Those two prepositional phrases spring straight out of the fact that we have been born again. You've got to kind of see the connection there. It's very important. And I like the fact with regards to this inheritance that we have that we move beyond being just saved and we move beyond being just citizens of heaven. You think of the angels for a moment. They are also citizens of heaven. They dwell with God. They live with God. But they don't have an inheritance. They're not sons. They simply live forever in the presence of God as eternal beings. You and I do not relate to God in the same way that they relate to God right now. That is not what is our future. God in his grace has lavished upon us something which is mind-boggling. That we as his redeemed children, undeserving sinners, would be given an inheritance. An inheritance like no other. Isn't that staggering that this would happen? Well, we all know and understand what an inheritance is, and you may have received one already. Uh, You probably haven't passed one on, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, But we understand how it works with an inheritance. A parent or a father or mother would pass an inheritance on to the siblings. The Bible tells us that we receive an inheritance from the Lord our God. Why? Because we are made sons and daughters of Christ, of the Father brothers and sisters with Christ. We're members of God's family. And so he, by his grace, gives us a wonderful inheritance. Listen to Galatians 4 on this. Galatians 4 and verses 6 to 7. This is so encouraging. God is so kind. He's so gracious. He says this, Paul says this, Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, that's Daddy, Daddy. It's a a term of endearment. 
So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, look at the logic here, if a son, then an heir through God. An heir. An heir. The Old Testament and the New Testament, while they both speak repeatedly about this concept of believers receiving an inheritance from the Lord. And I want to just camp here for a moment because this is very encouraging. Uh, Scripture uses that word and the idea of the inheritance in two distinct ways. The first is pretty obvious, and it's what we've just said. Believers receive an inheritance, but the second is not so obvious. The Bible tells us repeatedly that we are an inheritance to the Lord. We receive an inheritance, but we are his inheritance. And the way to look at that is this, that we are essentially a gift of love from the Father to the Son. We were purchased by the Son's death on the cross, made his own, but we are a gift of love for the Son. We are the bride, the church, and we will dwell with Christ in all eternity in his presence. That's what this is talking about here. The other inheritance, well, I want to camp on that as well for a moment. The Bible tells us that the people of God receive an inheritance when they go to be with the Lord. Or when Christ returns and comes to this world, he will give gifts to his children for their faithful service here on earth. And there's a sense in which that will be proportionate based upon what we have done for the Lord's, for the Lord's work and the Lord's kingdom. Um, Matthew 25, 34. The context of Matthew 25 is Jesus Christ coming and sitting here on earth on his royal throne at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, and he rewards his children for their faithful service. Verse 34, Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit the kingdom. We're also told that we will rule and reign with Christ. Maybe one very clear passage is Matthew 19, verses 27 to 29. Peter asks the question, and no one else probably would dare to ask it. Peter's very bold and kind of says things that no one else would dare to say. And he asks the question, uh, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What then will we have? He's making the obvious point. We've left everything to be your disciples. Everything. Jesus responds and he says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that promise is for the disciples only. It's not for you or me. It's just for those 12. That's what it says clearly. But then, verse 29, it gets extended to all believers. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. That is the graciousness and the kindness of the Lord our God. When he sits on his glorious throne, he will reward his children with blessings throughout the millennial kingdom. I love the fact that you and I are being treated by God the Father as though we were his own son. We are being treated as sons. And that is staggering. That is absolutely staggering and mind-boggling. You might also ask the question, well, is there a guarantee now that this inheritance will always be a future reality for those of us who believe? Because here we are and some of you are well, you're all different ages, obviously, but some of you have a long way to go. Will that always be a, a reality for me? Is there some kind of proof that I can have that that inheritance can be relied upon? Well, there actually is. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14 tells us that the Holy Spirit dwelling within us is a guarantee of that inheritance. Listen to this. In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the what? The guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So you've got some pretty strong and clear words there. Guarantee. 
Uh, the word's arabon, it means down payment or pledge. In extra biblical literature, that word would speak of the engagement ring. It's a sign and a seal of commitment which is binding. It cannot be altered, it cannot be changed. It's like the, the seal of the ring that the king would use and he would seal a document. It cannot be opened except by the person who it's designated to be received by. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so for us, friends, we should know that that inheritance that awaits us is a certainty. It will never leave, it will never depart. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And the more obvious his dwelling is within you, then I would dare to say that the more you are assured that that inheritance will be yours. We need only look at the fruit of the Spirit of God in our lives, the transformation, stop yourself and look back two, three, four, five years and see the work of sanctification in your life and know for certain that the Spirit of God is actively working within you. This should thrill your heart with joy as it does mine. And friends, again, coming back to the context of this letter, these believers were having brothers and sisters and uncles and aunties thrown into prison, burnt on stakes, property seized, inheritances, earthly inheritances taken away. They were losing everything, even their own lives. And for Peter to come along and say, you know what, you might lose your earthly inheritance, you might lose everything in this life, but it doesn't matter why, because there's a better one in heaven waiting for you. And if you think about the logic of that, does it matter if we lose everything here? Does it matter if you are a Lazarus at the gate of the rich man with nothing? Does it matter if you don't have that big house, that nice car, if you don't run with the world and live like the world? Does it matter if you live a simple life pleasing God? It doesn't matter if we go without in this life. All that matters is that we honour God. Because in a coming day, he's going to return and he will say, what have you done with what I've given you? And we need to realise that we have been placed here on earth, saved out of this world, because we're on a mission. We're soldiers in his army. We're here to share the gospel with the lost. We're here to build up the saints and to help to keep the bride of Christ pure so that when he returns, he receives her as a pure bride. We're not here to play games with the world. We're not here to step off into vanity fair and get caught up in the trappings and pursuits of this life. Only one life to live, and only what's lived for Christ will last, right? So I pray that this would encourage you to continually weed out of your own life, as I do, the trappings of this world the things that would prevent us from running the race well and giving our all and throwing our lot in with Christ, may we cast them off. This inheritance, well, it is so secure, isn't it? Look at verse 4. It is so secure. Peter comes along and he, he says to them, it is imperishable. It is imperishable. It is undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Again, Every earthly inheritance, well, you receive it and then you get old and you pass it on to the next person and it just kind of keeps filtering down, doesn't it? And there's probably one generation that says, I'm going to burn all this and spend it, but who cares? But that's generally how this works. Peter says to them, you know what? This inheritance that is yours, it is in heaven. It is going nowhere and it is yours. This phrase here, kept in heaven, uh, it, it simply means to cause a state to continue. And it's often used to refer to the act of watching, guard, uh, watching over something or guarding something, keeping watch. And the tense of the verb there is it's really important to understand this. It's what we would call a divine passive. The passive element means that you're not the one keeping. You're not the one doing the action. The action is being done upon you. Who's the one doing the guarding? Who's the one doing the keeping? It's God. And that's why it's called a divine passage. This tells us that God himself does the keeping. God himself does the guarding. This inheritance, well, it's away from all sources of corruption because it resides with God in heaven. 
He himself dwells in unapproachable light. And so there is no one or no thing that can corrupt, pervert, steal, twist, distort, or anything like that regarding the inheritance that is ours in Christ. God himself keeps watch over it. And this should bring joy to our souls. Friends, we aren't meant to be living our best life now. We aren't meant to be listening to those prosperity preachers and living our best life now. We're called to run the race, to be faithful servants of our Lord for his kingdom purposes. That's our calling. And I would say it this way, if you as a child of God, and I say this to myself, if you don't have at the centre of your thoughts and intentions fulfilling the will of God for your life, if that's not your focus, if that's not your drive, if that is not your direction, if it's simply an add-on or a point of contention in your mind over here that you know you should do, then I would say that you for a moment have been blinded and forgotten much regarding the calling of God on your life. There's an opportunity today to restore things with the Lord to make right things with the Lord, to remove from your life that which you are loving more than the Lord your God, to replace it by following him. And I think in this pursuit of Christ-likeness, this pursuit of being sold out for God, we look to people's examples, don't we? I think the Apostle Paul is probably the greatest example in the New Testament. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, I love these verses. These uh, motivate me, they encourage me, they strengthen me. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, Paul says this, and it's almost a response to the question, why are you so zealous, Paul? Why are you and the apostles almost seemingly out of your mind? And he says this, for the love of Christ controls us. Now, I think many people misunderstand this. And, and, and they think that that means that Paul just has this overwhelming love within his soul. Like that person you know that's just always happy, always joyful, always full of love. And you might look on and think, well, I don't have that. And that's just a person who's controlled by the love of Christ. That is not what this means at all. What this means is simple. It means that Paul has looked upon Christ at Calvary, dying for him, a Jewish man who hated Christ and his people and saved him. Paul is overwhelmed by what Christ did on Calvary. He's overwhelmed by the display of love that Christ showed to the world. It's that love of Christ that controls him. Does that make sense? He reflects on Christ. He's uh, controlled by that great display of love that Christ has on Calvary. And he tells us this in the verse because we have concluded this. Here's his reasoning, here's his logic that one has died for all, therefore all have died. One has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. Why? That those who live, that's you and I, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You see, the old life prior to coming to Christ. That was one where you and I were on the throne. We were calling the shots. We were the ruler. We were the Lord. We were the master. And when we came to Christ, that old person and that old way of living and that old self-enthronement has to go. And we die and we're recreated a new person in Christ. Now he's on the throne and we're on the cross. We live for him. We follow him. That's how this works. So he has caused us to be born again. He has given us a living hope. He gives us with a fortified heavenly inheritance. And the final point, uh, which causes us to praise God, is this, that he stands guard over our earthly lives. He stands guard over our earthly lives. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, and we can insert the you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is a, a direct reference to those believers here that Peter speaks to who are living on earth, who are all functioning as his ambassadors. He's telling them that they are being guarded even though they seem to be persecuted. You are being guarded. And again, that word is another military term. 
It refers to the work of a sentinel or a guard, someone who stands watch. Uh, it's what we would call a present passive participle. The present, this is happening right now. The passive, what does that mean? God is doing the guarding. And the participle with that refers to ongoing action. It's not just a one-off work of being a guard. God continues to stand guard. That's what he does. We are being continually guarded through faith. What does all of that mean? What does all of that mean if we bring all of that together? We could say it this way. The one who has been born again, adopted into God's family, washed and forgiven of all sin, declared righteous by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, the one who is safe and secure and has a future home with God, it is this one whom God has determined to ensure that they will continue on in their faith for the duration of their lives. This idea of God and the Lord Jesus Christ keeping watch over his children is everywhere in Scripture. John 17, 12, Jesus says this in his high priestly prayer to his Father, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. You see the two words again. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that's Judas, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. You see, I think that the believers, Peter anticipated what they might be thinking. And there's a sense in which they would say, well, that's great that I've been born again. And that's great that there's a future inheritance awaiting for me. But from where I stand to the day of my death, well, there could be some time here. And Peter probably anticipated that they might be thinking, well, you know what? In the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, maybe we'll cave in. Maybe we'll check out and step off that narrow pathway. And maybe they're afraid. Maybe that prevents them from praising God because they think, well, you know what? It's up to us to maintain our salvation or to find our own way to the end. Peter wants them to know, you know what? The Lord your God is with you. He hedges you in. When you drift off the path, he goads you back onto that path. That's exactly what the Lord our God does. Lewis Burkhoff, and I've got two quotes for you which are really helpful Lewis Burkhoff talks about this idea of God uh, helping the saints to persevere all the way to the end. He says this, Perseverance may be defined as that continuous operation of the Holy Spirit in the believer by which the the work of divine grace that is begun in the heart is continued and brought to completion. It is because God never forsakes his work that believers continue to stand firm to the very end. John Piper, well, I think this is probably a better quote. Uh, This is great. John Piper says it this way, The assurance of the believer is not that God will save him even if he stops believing, but that God will keep him believing. God will sustain you in faith. He will make your hope firm and stable to the end. He will cause you to persevere. End quote. You might ask the question, well, what about those people that I know? And they're in church, and you've all experienced a friend like that. They're in church, they understand truth, they've been running the race, they've been following, but they've walked away, they've apostatized, they've gone back to being an atheist. I knew they were a Christian and now they've departed. What about that? Doesn't that contradict everything we've just said? That's a good question and a good observation, but I would say that the truth of Scripture supersedes our own interpretation of life circumstances. We could say it this way, that if that person is a genuine believer and they've walked away, God in his grace will discipline them. Hebrews 12 tells us that. He will bring them back. But had that person not been born again, was it not a genuine conversion, then that person will simply drift away. What about my own choice to walk in faith? If God is the one who keeps goading me, if God is the one who keeps filling with faith, do I just stand back and and, and sit on the bus and take the ride to the end of eternity? Well, no. No. We have a great responsibility to, in a sense, partner with God in the sanctification process. He, by his Spirit, is conforming us to the image of his Son. And you and I, as his children, make daily choices 
to put off sin and put on truth, right? Put off the flesh and walk in the newness of life by putting on the spirit. We fight the fight daily. We rely upon him. We study the word. We delight in the word. And we do battle with sin and temptation. That's our responsibility. And what happens when you don't? You dry out. You become lethargic. You become empty. And there's conviction. And there's fruitlessness for a time. But God in his grace, because he loves us, he disciplines us, and he brings us back into line with him. That is a responsibility that we have, friends. And I pray that for all of us here who are running this race, for all of us here who are serving the Lord, following the Lord, that we might be able to stop and, and essentially preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Find strength. Find the ability to run well by looking at who Christ is and what he has done and what you and I have in him. That's what Peter was wanting for these believers and I believe that that's what he wants for us this morning. Be enamoured with Christ. Have Christ and his gospel and the great work of salvation magnified in your mind and then you will run well. And then you will pry your own hands off the things of this world and you will live fully for him. And there may be some here this morning who are not there. There may be some of you who have not been born again. And I bring to you Jesus' words in John 3. Unless a man be born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Friends, the offer of salvation is through Jesus Christ. And it comes through his people to the world. If that is you, I plead with you this morning. Today is the day of salvation. Turn to God. Surrender your life. Believe and be born again. Come to life. Come to life by believing in Christ. Give up living for yourself and come to the cross and live for him. I pray that this would be true of you this morning. And if you need to speak to anyone, there's a whole lot of believers here this morning who would love to talk to you about how it is that you can come to Christ for salvation. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to seek your face this morning, to open your word. And Father, I pray that you would magnify your son to us in our own hearts and our own minds. I pray that you would rekindle the calling of yourself on our lives, that we would be overwhelmed by the fact that we have been bought with a price, the precious blood of your Son, and that our lives are not our own. Father, I pray that you would weave this into our characters. Father, as we go out into the week, as we are tempted possibly to live for this world, to find joy in the things of this world, that you would remind us that we are citizens of heaven, that we are here as ambassadors of Christ, and that we will live our lives wholly and solely for you. We give thanks to you for this morning, and we ask for your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen.